Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good, afternoon. <laughs> and, uh, good morning to those who might be joining me from the other side of the Greenwich Meridian or waking up. Um, as Millicent very rightly presented me, I'm a, a medical doctor and a senior research scientist working at Kemi um, as an epidemiologist and also as an ML practitioner. And uh, my interests are, um, I think, relative to this presentation, uh, how can um, health, how can AI be leveraged in health and also in the other fields of um, medical research to improve stuff um, more relevantly for Africa? Um, let me just make sure I am presenting yes. uh, the screen. Are you seeing my screen? It's coming. All right. Okay, um, great. Um, okay. Um, so allow me to start off uh, with just giving you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'll first give you a bird's eye view of um, artificial intelligence and the relevant topics, um, just to bring us all on board in the same step. And how does health use AI? Um, what Kemri is doing with AI and challenges in implementing AI in healthcare in Africa. And I think that's maybe of special interest to, to many of us um, because it's the unique thing about this presentation. And also approaches to Thank you. actually, all right, is there anyone? And, and what approaches you can actually use to realize more fruitful research and innovation in AI um, for health in Africa. Okay, um, something else. Okay, next slide. move to the next slide. Um, I, I don't know what's, what's happening. That was a, it was working very well. <laughs> I just don't know what's happened. Let me. Wait, are you sharing the slide? Yeah, we can. You want to? Or just try connecting again with the window. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the joys of meeting rooms. <laughs> just give him like three minutes to restart the system, and uh, everything will be fine, I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just restart the system. We'll be patient enough to wait for you, Doctor. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Andrew. you. And so you want to? No, I'm just going to click on the browser now.
can happen. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, so, um, yeah, that's where we were. Uh, just the plan for the, the talk. And um, yeah, straight on to the first point. Um, so allow me to just go over some of what I think are the fundamental um, differences between traditional programming as we know it and deep learning. Uh, and I think we'll really appreciate also some of the problems when you look at deep learning and also um, the challenges in implementing it. Um, so I would like to make an application that um, is able to tell apart shapes, a simple application that's able to tell apart shapes. And we first start with the traditional programming approach. And uh, what we conventionally do is uh, uh, write up the code that we are going to use. And um, uh, we, at this point, we know what shapes look like. We know that a circle is round. And if the circle is round, it's a, if the shape is round, it's a circle. It, it has three sides, a triangle, and, and that kind of thing. Um, one thing we need to really appreciate now is we already have the logic. We already know what if statements to put in the program and how to actually code it up, right? And um, we simply go ahead and feed that logic into a computer program. And when we run the program, we get our answer. However, with deep learning, um, we what we first start out with is uh, getting the data. We search for multiple examples of um, circles, squares, and triangles, and feed it into a neural network that is able to come up with its own logic uh, using calculus. Uh, we don't code that logic this time around. And now what we do is just feed in the data and uh, train it to predict or uh, to give us the right answers. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, when we actually go out and use this program, uh, which has a neural network, uh, doing all the logic, we get our answers. Now, it's 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 pretty, the example I've given is pretty trivial because um, we are just looking at three things here. Uh, we, we know the logic, we're looking at shapes, it's pretty trivial. But it's not so, it's, um, and frankly, if, if this was all there was in terms of problems to solve, we'd stick to a traditional approach of uh, using programming. But the, the, when the logic gets complicated and we have to deal with telling apart a picture of a zebra from a picture of a giraffe and a, or a picture of a rhino, we don't even know the set of if statements to use and code into our program. And that's where deep learning comes in. Uh, we just feed in examples of um, different pictures of giraffes, zebras, and rhinos and train it to predict the right answer. And in the middle, it will come up with its own logic. And um, with, this, with this approach, we are able to actually uh, do much more complex things that uh, conventional or uh, traditional programming or other uh, um, machine learning approaches could not do. Um, which brings us to the next part of our overview. Uh, and we'll hastily look, hastily look at the different topics in deep learning. Uh, when we're talking about computer vision, we are training or tasking neural networks to understand and perceive things as humans do. Um, now, there are different subtopics in um, computer vision, and that's image classification, where we actually simply want to um, uh, ask the neural network to tell apart what the zebra or what to, to tell apart pictures and um, determine what they are. In the previous slide, we see what the zebra was, what the giraffe was, and what the rhino was. Um, it might be more useful if you actually knew where in that picture the different objects of interest are. And that's what object detection is. Um, in here, we know that this picture has a dog, a puppy, cute puppy, and a kitten. Um, <laughs> And we also know uh, using those bounding rectangles where they actually are located. And this is quite important in medicine. This is a picture, of, a picture that is typically looked at by clinical pathologists. And here the neural network has been trained to actually not only see that these are different types of blood cells, but where each of these blood cells are located. Um, 
this looks like an, an, uh, a pretty normal blood cell to me, but in cases where we are looking at looking looking out for cells that um, are cancerous uh, in, in, with different leukemias, it, it becomes quite important. Such so uh, the clinical pathologist does not miss out on on what they're supposed to see. Now, image segmentation is uh, a little bit more granular. We don't only want to know where what is in the picture, where in the picture it is, but which pixels in that picture actually belong to that object of interest. And I'm sure you can make out the cute puppy and the cute kitten uh, from uh, what, you're, what you're seeing before you. Um, in, in, uh, in uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And this is a picture of a CAT scan. Um, and what the neural network has been trained to do here is to actually um, locate and show all the pixels in this CAT scan that belong to this tumor. Uh, this is a brain tumor, and um, and we can see what why we need to be more granular because we need to be very particular if we're going to give any form of treatment only to that tumor and not damage the surrounding tissue. Um, other topics in um, deep learning of interest to health are natural uh, language processing and um, uh, automatic speech uh, recognition. Allow me to just go into those uh, examples later in the presentation. Um, so how does health use artificial intelligence? And I'll start off by saying that if there is one area in health that from the very early years of AI has had a lot of attention in computer vision, it's radiology. And um, I, I think it's pretty simple to know why, because in radiology, what we are really dealing with is images and interpreting images which is really what uh, computer vision is about. Uh, neural networks have been very impressive in interpreting chest X-rays, MRI scans, and um, even ultrasounds. And actually, in some cases, have been able to outperform certified radiologists on some tasks. Um, now, that's that on some data sets. And when I say data sets, I mean they might not be able to outperform these certified radiologists when uh, these networks actually rolled out in, in clinical settings. Um, radiotherapy is also, or more specifically, image guided radiotherapy um, is, uh, is one of those areas where neural networks have assisted cancer radiotherapists to prepare the execution plans up to seven times faster. And uh, you may be aware of Microsoft's project Inner Eye, I think led by the uh, team at Cambridge. and. Uh, I was really impressed when I was reading about it because it really has a meaningful impact on the delivery of healthcare and the lives of the radiotherapists and also the lives of the patients because more people are, are able to access uh, the service in a given period of time. Neural networks have also been very impressive in diagnosing skin tumors as a task of image classification and in assisting clinical pathologists, as you may remember from the slide I shared with you, in more attentively ensuring that they're able to look at the minor details in the, under the microscope without missing any, 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 um, and, and hence increasing their accuracy as they, as they do their task. Um, when you talk about na uh, natural language processing, I think uh, you may all agree that at its very core, um, medicine is about conversation and conversations between the healthcare professional and the ailing patient. And, uh, NLP, and, and hence why NLP plays a very central role um, in healthcare. In fact, if there's one area in healthcare that can really have immediate and long lasting impacts in healthcare, I think it's, it's, it's really natural language processing and it's different um, uh, topics under it. Uh, NLP has helped in healthcare delivery. Um, there are many examples where doctors don't need to spend so much time writing, writing the clinical notes, but um, Use it, but by using automatic speech uh, recognition and um, transcription, uh, able to transcribe the notes automatically into text as they give more of their attention to, to the patient. And this actually gives more fruitful uh, consultations for the patient and also for the, for the, for the, for the doctor. Uh, conversational AI chatbots have been useful in um, following up patients and just helping the doctors to keep track of the patients even after leave the consultation. Now, one interesting part, uh, one interesting thing that NLP has come through for, for health 
and not only health, but also the biomedical sciences, other biomedical sciences, is uh, knowledge discovery. And in this area, in this, we, uh, because neural networks can be trained to read large amounts, tons and tons of research papers, and actually derive meaning from them, um, they are able to actually process a lot of the science, a lot of the information out in the papers, even faster than what researchers are able to, to do. For example, in 2020 alone, the year of the virus corona, 200,000 papers were published on COVID-19. Now, even if you have uh, a research group that's, whose work is just to read paper, that's quite a lot of information. And, and you don't really know if you're actually getting the latest research um, out there just from what is presented to you. And um, an AI-powered search engine was able to process all these 200,000 papers, and it was able to give specific questions, uh, specific answers to questions on, on COVID-19 that researchers and also uh, doctors may have, and this better informed their treatment, um, their treatment outcomes. And, and, and this is not only uh, in this type of knowledge discovery, uh, with knowledge discovery, uh, NLP is also able to predict better uh, targets for drugs or even to repurpose old drugs. In some cases, old cancer drugs are being used to treat infectious diseases in ways that no one, no one else could have previously uh, easily found out. Um, and this is really useful, uh, not only in medicine, but also in other biomedical sciences. Um, so I talked about automatic speech recognition and how it's able to transcribe clinical notes for doctors, and it's also able to transcribe clean, uh, radiological re reports for radiology for radiologists. Um, and I think one other place that uh, we are coming to appreciate, or we, we really are seeing a, uh, quite an impact, is in what I call deep models. Uh, clinical decision support systems are uh, are systems that assist doctors to just look at all the information they are getting as they manage the patients and either predict the, the clinical condition of the patient and inform better action early enough rather than late. In medicine, time is life. I was about to say time is money, but yeah, time is life. And in some cases, if you just intervene 24 hours earlier with a treatment, you're able to save the patient's life. And predictive uh, clinical decision support systems have been quite impressive. Uh, clinical decision support systems are not new. Uh, they existed previously and used other approaches, but deep models are able to digest, uh, to take in more data, digest it, and uh, actually predict what's going to happen to patients. Um, I'll bring out some examples of uh, NLP here, and in this text, you're able to see um, a clinical note um, about James, a 50-year-old male who is a known diabetic and has been uh, with this condition for the last five years. And uh, what you can train neural networks to actually do is actually structured. What I've read here is not structured. It's a free text uh, piece of information. Um, but say you have hundreds of these uh, uh, records and you'd really like to know what's, get more information out of it. And with named entity recognition, you're able to, to identify the patient by his name, know his age, his uh, gender and also the medical condition that he has. Um, and also you're able to know that he's complaining of uh, the two, these two symptoms, that's blurring of vision and um, inability to see at night. Some uh, neural network models are even able to predict that this patient might be having um, early signs of uh, diabetic retinopathy while presented with this text, all right? Um, and intent classification is one of the other topics of uh, NLP that's that's used. From this conversation, and I actually uh, got this from one of the research papers out there, um, neural networks are able to just look at this information and know what's going on. In this, uh, for example, in this piece of text, uh, the patient is actually talking about palpitations, which is uh, feelings or sensations that your heart is beating fast. And we kind of experience that sometimes. Um, what I'm going through right now, but um, in this in this information, it's quite it, it's it's quite relevant um, and helpful for the clinician in this case. Um, there, let's look at radiology now. Um, 
And one thing, as I said earlier, that neural networks have been very good at is, uh, if trained, is looking at chest X-rays. And why particularly chest X-rays? I think uh, of all the branches or, or data on radiology, chest X-rays are the most common uh, technique used, and hence there's a lot of data, and hence a lot of uh, mileage has been done in uh, training neural networks to identify uh, different uh, diseases in chest X-ray. Here, the neural network has been trained to actually predict that this, particip uh, this um, patient has pneumonia. And not only that, uh, with, uh, with image uh, segmentation, you actually, uh, the, the radiologists or the clinician is uh, able to see where exactly in his chest the pneumonia has hit him the worst using these uh, heat maps that you can actually see. Um, you, 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 uh, it'd be right to, to say that the, what is in red is maybe a more severe, severe form of the disease and the green patches are maybe uh, less severe forms of the disease. And this information is quite important. I'll get back to this slide later in the, in the, in, in the presentation to actually bring out some of the things um, that are actually challenges when you are coming to implementing AI in health. Um, so what are we doing at Camry? Um, and I'll just highlight some of the three um, interesting things. There is a lot, but three, some of the three interesting things that you're doing at Camry uh, with uh, AI. Um, one is uh, a project where we are looking at how we can train neural networks to understand uh, uh, ultrasounds taken from handheld ultrasound devices when used by nursing, uh, by nurse midwives. And we're trying to address two, two problems in health. One is that not many mothers, especially those in the remote areas, are able to have access to uh, an ultrasound early in their pregnancy. And this is actually one of the guidelines uh, put out by the World Health Organization. Um, an early ultrasound is able to estimate the age of the, of, of the, of the, of the fetus. And this is uh, quite important in how you're going to manage or picking up early clini uh, uh, clinical problems that the mother may have early and hence informing better action. Um, and two is, is that there's an absolute shortage of radiologists, not only in Kenya, not only in Africa, but also in the world. Uh, not only uh, and or radiographers or even more uh, better trained ultrasonographers. Uh, and because of this um, short of, uh, shortage, it this uh, the gist of this project is really about increasing access to care, and we hope that uh, the impact will be democrat will be in democratizing better health to those mothers who may not be able to access um, quality healthcare in the first place. All right. Um, the other thing that we are that we are doing is um, I lead a group of uh, clinical officers and we are using uh, digital uh, tablets, we're using tablets to, to collect information as the patients uh, come or as the study participants come. And you may know from your personal experience that using tablets to type in, type in um, text of anything is, is quite difficult. It's, 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 it's harder than, than using your, your, your handheld uh, phone. And what we are trying to do is uh, creating models. I think we, we are now using just uh, an n-gram model to uh, predict the text that the, uh, that the clinical officers are going to type next, um, less suggestively, but in a way that's going to improve their speed uh, while, taking the, while taking the histories. And in this way, they are able to give more attention to the, they're able to give more attention to the study participants and use less of that of the attention actually typing in um, the the clinical histories on the tablets, and um, and we would uh, we'd like to improve it. Uh, neural networks would probably would obviously do a better job, and uh, we're just we're currently right now just in the data collection phase to to get all that data and feed it into some form of neural network. Um, I work with the entomology group at Cambry, and. What we are doing is using machine learning to predict which genes in mosquitoes uh, make them resistant to insecticides, um, and it, it, it really it it and how how we're trying to go about this is actually presenting the whole genome of uh, mosquitoes that 
have been seen to be resistant to um, different uh, insecticides uh, and those that are not resistant and seeing what are the what are the what are the real genes um, that are at play and conferring these superpowers if you may to these mosquitoes uh, and once we know that we're able to characterize the mosquitoes better and maybe even inform better um, development of insecticides yeah um, so having had this uh, maybe 360 view of what we're doing in health and how AI is actually helping in health yeah I'd like to just look at um, what are the challenges in healthcare in AI in Africa and first I'd say that these challenges are one not unique to AI in health they also affect other industries like um, uh, finance industry other biomedical sciences bioinformatics and, and that sort of thing and two uh, they are not unique to implementing AI in Africa I believe they also affect I believe they also affect um, the Western world um, other continents um, to, to various degrees. Some are unique to Africa and we'll get to them and you'll appreciate that. So uh, the first culprit, as many of you may suspect, uh, it's data. And um, the, this is a problem all over the place, but with healthcare, there's a bigger problem with data in that um, we need a lot of data to train any model tons and tons of data and medical data but medical data needs to be kept confidential uh, the privacy of, me of medical information is actually an assurance that many uh, healthcare providers should give to their should give to their patients uh, and because of this uh, what actually happens is that we have silos of data that cannot be made available to the community of researchers um, in, in machine learning so they can learn from them and create better models or um, innovations in healthcare. Uh, there are wide efforts to de-anonymize health records but still this is it, it's 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 it still is a problem um, even when health research is published uh, when health AIs come out in my experience uh, they are the only papers where I cannot replicate the results because the data sets are not provided. Uh, so you, you kind of just have to accept that this is what the model configuration was for the neural network and this is what we did and these are the results. You really can't replicate the results on you um, for yourself. Um, but there's another thing with, uh, with, with data and this is peculiar to health in that you need, uh, I started off by saying that neural networks learn with labeled data and if you remember we labeled our triangles and circles and squares um, anyone can do that but with medical data you need experts to to actually label the data uh, you you need doctors uh, and a lot of medical expertise to actually say that this is a chest x-ray with tb here is where the tb is worst and here is where um maybe uh, it's not so bad and this makes labeling uh, and this affects uh, or confounds the problem of data in two ways in that it's expensive to label it's much more expensive to label medical data and two uh, you at the end of the day you don't have as much data as you probably would have uh, wanted to train your model um, and um, I think lastly is a lot of the rich data from which, and this is maybe more unique to Africa, uh, a lot of the rich data from which neural networks can learn from is still handwritten. Um, many hospitals are still use handwritten clinical notes, either for their consultations in the outpatient or for uh, uh, during the medical rounds that are conducted in the inpatient um, uh, ward rounds. And so there's a whole bunch of data out there in the medical field that cannot be accessed by anything digital, uh, leave alone uh, neural networks. And, and this is quite a problem for, and, and this is quite a problem for, uh, uh, for you know, health AI. Um, the other problem that we have is bias. 
And uh, this is not unique, again, to health. And I think it's what I call the garbage in, garbage out problem of AI. The accuracy of a neural network um, when making predictions depends very, it depends a lot on how similar that new data is to the data that the neural network was trained on in the first place. And most AI applications uh, that are still in use in Africa have been trained with data sourced from outside of the continent. And this may introduce a lot of inaccuracies with time um, when they're making predictions or are deployed in, in African settings. Um, the, there's one thing unique is that uh, the uh, health AI may, may be able to short circuit this problem uh, for this reason, because in some cases, uh, there really are no differences between um, uh, the information um, that neural networks, the data that has been trained uh, um, in, for example, uh, for example, you, uh, variables in the African physiology may not be different from those variables in other populations. And if you're training a neural network to identify the different uh, types of cells in a blood film, if you remember the image, um, I mean, white blood cells look like white blood cells. They are the same or red blood cells look like red blood cells um, in either in different races, in different populations, and even in different ages. And in some cases, this may not be a problem that you may face when implementing um, um, AI systems um, between continents or implementing them afresh in, in Africa. So um, when you're dealing with bias, it's really important to know if Hello. it has been. Yes. Just I go on? <laughs> yeah, so when you're looking at bias, um, it, 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 it's not a problem that affects health all the time, but when it does, uh, be careful to know how it does and how you can go around it. Um, I think the next one, to, uh, the next problem is something we call a calibration drift. And this is not unique to health but more, pro more pronounced in it. And when we're talking about uh, calibration drift, it's actually the consequence of deploying medical uh, models in environments where there are differences between the data on which the model was trained on and also the data to which it is applied. So some of these differences may happen over time um, because the, it's, it's a different set of patients that are being exposed to the same model, uh, even, if it's, even if it was trained on accurate data in the first place. But the data changes, yeah, and it's more a problem in health because the the production cycles in health are more are more elongated. You may find that uh, you got you may have uh, approval, uh, some regulatory approval, to put out your first version of a model and actually use it in a clinical setting, uh, and you think that oh, let's update the data and have a version two but you have these regulatory hiccups that you have to go through and it takes an, an, uh, one more year to get your version two out. And by the time you're getting your version two out, the data that's currently being exposed to the model that's out there is different. So this calibration drift is kind of more pronounced in healthcare. And it's something that, um, I mean, as, as researchers or innovators in the health space, we need to pay attention to uh, when looking at uh, health AI. Other, other problems that I'll quickly go through is just the cost of the, uh, because I think they are not unique to AI uh, or leave alone uh, AI in health in Africa. Is cost, the cost of deploying these models is uh, the cost of developing and the cost of maintenance is high. Um, I think uh, neural networks use a lot of memory, use a lot of GPU power to make their predictions. Uh, I think more than any other application out there, and the cost of the cost of just running a neural network is high. Um, other challenges is um, inadequate infrastructure. We may not feel it in Nairobi or even in Kenya because we are quite developed, but internet out there in the continent is quite patchy, and um, many state of the art models are too huge. And if you are going to run them from the cloud, you really have to look at or consider the problem of latency. Deploying models in these environments will be um, unreliable and connectivity will bring a lot of challenges. You may want to see if uh, you can 
uh, explore on-device uh, deployments for your AI applications. Um, so it may be good to just, first of all, have a rough idea of your deployment environment before you actually decide what model to use or how you're going to solve the, model, to solve the problem. And um, I think for all you skeptics out there, yes, neural networks can be wrong. In fact, they can be very, very wrong. Uh, uh, there's need to understand and communicate this to uh, those who are going to use the model. Uh, and, you know, not have this notion that neural networks are infallibly correct all the time. Um, because this will present a lot of issues. Um, so we're going to switch gears a bit, and I am getting to the end, starting to get to the end of the presentation. Uh, and, and I think it's more interesting from now on. And we will look at how do we approach research and innovation in health AI uh, in Africa. It could also be in other continents. And I will start off with a quote uh, from, um, you may know Geoffrey Hinton, and he is one of the, I'd say, grandfathers of, neuro, of modern day AI. And uh, back in 2016, this is what he had to say, and I'll just put it out there. He said that people should stop training radiologists now. It's just, not, it's just completely obvious that within five years, uh, deep learning is going to be to do a lot better than radiologists. And he said this at a hospital, uh, quite brief of him. Uh, this is 2022. I know that, um, I know radiologists who still have their job. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and some were still going to, to, to get their degree, um, a master's degree in radiology. But this is a problem uh, that he has. It's, 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 it's that he has, it, and he's quite a sharp, he's, he's very smart. Uh, but he said something that's not so smart. When we are approaching health AI, um, I think it's very important to, to just uh, know that we, we are not really here to uh, sort of like uh, contest with doctors, uh, contest with nurses, but we're actually here to give them superpowers, you know. Um, AI, health, AI in health should never be an arm wrestling, an arm wrestling contest uh, be, with health professionals and seeing if you, are, you, you can perform better than them, but really seeing that how you can give them an Iron Man suit so they can go out there and do their duties uh, more proficiently and more efficiently, uh, as you can see from the GIF I tried to, to show you. So it really should be about giving doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals superpowers. Um, and having that approach, I think there's Another quote I'd like to, to just put out there by Professor Fei Fei Li. She's a professor at Stanford University. If uh, some of you may be aware of uh, the ImageNet database and um, the, how it's an important benchmark for image classification tasks, she really is the person behind forming it, uh, bringing it up together. And she said that, um, she says this, and I quote, to every computer science uh, PhD or student who joins her team, uh, she leads the health AI team at Stanford. I ask them to, first of all, close their laptops, go out there and shadow doctors in the hospital. Try to understand and empathize with what they're doing. Try to see how, um, how much um, tiresome it is to just keep through around or for the nurses to actually work. And then afterwards, come back and we'll talk about what problems we can help them solve. Having a shared problem, having a shared uh, understanding of what the problem is. And I think, um, you know, when you have a hammer, and in this case, a neural network or a state-of-the-art uh, paper, you know, everything looks like a nail. In it. And you, it, it gets very tempting to think that you can go out there and just because you have this good neural network, you can solve any problem. And I think it's really, really important from what she's saying to learn uh, what are the particular pain points that healthcare professionals, nurses, and even hospital manager, managers are facing out there before you think that you can actually go and make something that helps them. Uh, a problem could be quite conspicuous from the outside, but when you actually solve it, you don't really have any impact that's going to help them. You know, It's like giving maybe 
high on man, a suit that doesn't fly, right? And uh, yes, you've solved your problem. Yes, your metrics are okay. It's accurate. It's, you know, um, but it's not really helping the situation. And you've wasted all this time and work because you're not having any impact in health. And it's quite subtle. Sometimes the solution could just be a piece of paper or a chat and not necessarily your neural network. And it's good to digest that and go back and actually meet them at their point of need rather than from what you perceive as the AI researcher to be their pain points and what the solution and what uh, and accept the solution that you have. Um, and I think one other thing with AI is, uh, first I'll explain it to the problem with AI is that we have a black box problem in that we really know what we put into the neural network and we really know uh, and we can measure the predictions that come out at the other end of the neural network. But how the neural network actually comes up with its logic to determine that this picture is a picture of a cat and this is a picture of a lion, we don't really know. And it's called a black box problem. And why it is more a problem in healthcare is that the decisions that is, is at the end of the day, you're going to suggest um, suggest um, decisions to a doctor who has to make them for a patient, which could determine the outcome, uh, the outcome which could be a healthy patient or, or a patient who passes away. And you know, a doctor cannot say that it's a neural network that told me to give the patient this drug. I mean, that doesn't happen. You can't. We are not at the point where. Uh, and I hope we never get there, that we blame neural networks for this. But because of this, we need to know that at the end of the day, the healthcare professional is accountable for the decisions that are made and not a neural network, even though we have, um, even though we have the black box, black box problem. And this actually brings uh, our, us to, it is really important to make uh, products out there which may use AI, but have an effort at explaining why the neural network or where the neural network is, um, is predicting something to be. For example, it's not enough to just say that this is a chest X-ray that has, um, that has uh, tuberculosis. And um, it's it, putting an effort at, at explainability is important. And from the second, from, from what is highlighted here, you can actually just know what the neural network is thinking. It thinks that the place that has been hardest hit by this tuberculosis is the top right aspect of the lung. Uh, and there are some patches of, of it in the other places. Now, I would dare say that the neural network is wrong on the left uh, uh, upper aspect of the lung. And what it's actually predicting to be pneumonia, or right over here where the mouse is, is actually a shadow of the bone. If you can just, uh, I can hear some surprises in the room. If you can, if you can. <laughs> yeah, I told you that neural networks are not infallibly correct. It's actually um, a shadow of the bone overlapping with that of the ribs, where if you can see where the mouse is, there's no process, there's no uh, TB process happening here. Right, um, but what I'm trying to say that it it, it 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 lays a better platform for the healthcare professional to use uh, the neural network when he knows what the neural network is predicting, and he knows where it can be wrong and where it gets it right most of the time. Um, and this would one facilitate uh, two things. It reveals an intuition as to how the neural network is working to the healthcare professional, even though they don't really know how it arrived at those decisions. And two, it helps the healthcare professional to know when to trust it and when not to trust it, all right? And it, it, it and creates a better environment for us for the research and innovation in health AI to go on. Um, so with that, I hope I have come to give you sort of like a good overview and foundation of what health AI is and how it can be more appropriately approached in um, in, in Africa. Um, I'd say this, that um, uh, 
AI will never replace doctors, but doctors who use AI will replace doctors who don't um, in a matter of time. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So um, at this point, I'll accept any question. Those are not my initials, Kiyonti Nawari, but uh, any question <laughs> um, oh, that you oh may have, <laughs> and uh, we can all address it. All right. Um, thank you. We have a number of questions. I think I'll start with the last one by Mark. Mark, maybe you could voice your question, because I think I can only see three or four questions. So I think we can have the, the no, no attendees problem. ask directly. So yeah. Okay. No I hope they're not too hard. <laughs> Thank you for the great presentation. Um, I'm just wondering what Cambry is doing um, to combat one of the problems that you stated, and that is lack of sufficient data. Uh, who are the key partners to resolve this? Are you doing anything about it? Okay, so we are sourcing the data uh, on all the studies that I presented, uh, the one on the ultrasound, the one on uh, uh, prediction of clinical um, uh, text, prediction in, in clinical text, and also the one uh, on, um, you know, understanding the mosquito genome. We're actually going out there and sourcing the data for ourselves. So there's no, um, these are projects that we are implementing from the ground up. We are training uh, nursing midwives on how to use the handheld devices. Uh, we are, you know, enrolling mothers into the studies. It's actually a research process. And then now getting those um, um, ultra, ultrasound videos, and then we're going to feed them into, into some form of neural network that we come up with. Same to the medical uh, text prediction. We're actually sourcing the data, and then learning from it. And... Um, also, uh, similarly to what we're doing at the, as an entomology group, we actually go out at night to catch those mosquitoes <laughs> um, and uh, expose them to expose them to different. Um, I, I don't know if my Eric, if you're here, if you want to just talk about that. Uh, maybe he's not, but expose it to the different insecticides and actually see which ones are stands and which ones are not. Yeah. Okay. I, I am here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, so yeah. sorry, I I sort of I didn't um, get the question. Yeah. Uh, uh, the question for Mark is how are you actually going out and solving the data problem? And I'm particularly talking about the ML uh, machine learning project uh, for mosquitoes. How are we getting that data? Um, how are oh. we getting it? Yep. Yeah. Yes, so with the mosquito um, project, we are actually collecting the mosquitoes ourselves. We are um, rearing them in our lab. We are sequencing them. We're getting the geno geno genotype data, so the genome data using sequencing uh, techniques, so whole genome sequencing and RNA sequencing. And based on that, um, we have so many replicates that we're able to use machine learning to detect um, any potential markers that could tell of uh, genotypes that might be coding for resistance. All right. Uh, thank you. All right. Um, next, Geoffrey, you have your hand up, maybe briefly, and then we'll maybe take two more questions. Which Geoffrey is that? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Geoffrey Sagwe, sorry. <laughs> the one with hand up. <laughs> Geoffrey Sagwe. Yes, um, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Uh, mine, mine is a quick one. When it comes to this, uh, the deep neural networks, the challenge is about um, what is, is uh, how can you address the, the ethical implication when it comes to privacy? Um, challenge when under the patient's data. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. One is. Uh, A lot of the, the, the research that could be done is could be done within uh, health AI research could be done within the context of clinical studies, and um, you could actually consent the the, the 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 study. Now you're looking at the patients as study participants, and when you're enrolling them into the study, actually consent them to allow you to use any medical information that you're going to get 
from them. And this is the approach we're using, for example, in the uh, ultrasound um, study that we're doing. We're actually asking mothers to allow us to use uh, the ultrasound um, data to learn, uh, to, to, to teach neural networks, um, to teach neural networks. Um, so that's one, just asking them, all right? You might not get so far because you, because they are only, because clinical studies are expensive, they have to be done within a budget, and um, you need to, uh, you know, see how much you can actually get from them. The other approach is actually using, there are some, there are some uh, clinical data sets out there, not uh, from African patients, that can still be relevant. As I told you, some of the, some of the things in medicine are constant. I mean, medical practice is fairly the same. Clinical notes may fairly be the same. And you may actually uh, jump over the hurdle of bias, even though you're going to use data sets from other countries, right? And two, and this is, and two is, uh, I mean, three, um, when you actually roll out your models, um, you could uh, think of federated machine learning. And this is um, a form of machine learning that takes place within the device that the, uh, that the user is using. You know, uh, you are still teaching the model on the new data that is coming into the device um, without actually sharing that data out to, out, you know. So it's actually machine learning in deployment uh, when you're talking about uh, federated machine learning. And it's an approach that can help uh, us also jump over the hurdle of, uh, you know, a little data and also over the hurdle of our calibration drifts. Yeah. Um, okay, I don't know if we have time for one last question. Uh, Leonard will have this conversation later. Let's just uh, maybe turn it over to Ayman who has a question, Ayman Mohammed, regarding the successes. I don't know if you want to voice it all, I read it out. Yeah. All right. So um, he's asking, can you please share some successes or wins for health in AI from in Camry or in Africa in general? Some of the successes. Okay, good. Um, AI is something we're starting out in Camry, and um, the projects I told you about are really in the big early phases or early phases that we early phases. So we can't say if they're going to be successful or not. Right. Uh, there is some research paper that's recently come out um, about the ultrasounds and using handheld devices. Um, and this is data from Zambia, and it shows that uh, it, it, it's, it is quite successful. I mean, what what the machine learning models are able to predict is in terms of estimating the fetal ages. Um, the mean uh, the mean absolute error is quite narrow when compared with that of uh, trained uh, ultrasonographers. So we are going to really replicate and see if it really works also in Kenya. Um, in Africa, there are many startups that have looked, uh, AI startups that have looked at, um, I initially mentioned uh, how AI has been used in dermatology and we are able to, uh, and they have been able to use neural networks to diagnose skin tumors uh, on uh, black skin, I can use that especially because uh, many of the previous data sets on, uh, on using uh, neural networks to diagnose tumors were on white skin. And hence, when, when, those, new, when those neural networks were, uh, were used to predict uh, what skin tumors are on dark skin, they were not able, their, their, their accuracies were not as accurate, but these um, startups have actually uh, been able to solve that problem. Uh, we have, um, the chest X-rays that I showed you uh, were actually are actually from um, uh, data of the use of data collected from implementations in Rwanda, and uh, they have actually been able to put X-ray machines and miniaturize them, such that even healthcare workers can carry them on their back, go to the village, get chest X-rays, and then use machine learning to diagnose if the participants have TB or not. So there are many wins for there are already many wins. Uh, for healthcare in, in, when it uses AI. And I think the future is bright uh, when investing in, the, in this kind of innovation. All right. Thank you very much for all in attendance. So, Millicent, back to you.
Oh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I hope uh, you all found it very, very useful. Uh, personally, I found it very, very educating and enlightening. I hope you had fun <laughs> uh, learning about AI in health. And at this point, we are going to close this session and uh, we'll keep you updated for our next seminar session. Thank you so much for joining.